All right, I'm sorry. Uh, where were we before we were so rudely interrupted? All right. What about a waiver of inspection? There are some buyers that actually choose to waive the inspection. I told you a minute ago that I'm not a big fan of this, especially for the owner-occupied purchase. Now, if you're dealing a lot of investors and they have a huge plan to do a massive rehab, or it's very obvious that it's uh, in need of a rehab, you could actually waive inspections. That is fine. There are situations when that might occur. But now let me tell you one thing that I would do if in fact your client decided to waive the inspection, even from an owner occupied standpoint, I would want to make sure that that not only got noted in the purchase agreement when you marked no inspection, I would also have some kind of disclaimer that your client would sign and acknowledge as a kind of a, hey, you really don't want it inspected, right? That way they can never have any situation where they come back to you and go, I didn't understand. You know, this world is very litigious here lately and everybody wants to try and blame someone else. And I would probably want to CYA and have a form that said, uh, hey, you understand I'm not advocating this or this goes against better judgment or are you sure? And have them sign it. Worst case scenario, I would want something in an email form uh, to make sure that you could print out and put it in there so that if anything ever happened, you could say, well, I got an email from him saying that he didn't want it to inspect it. That would be probably the least of, that I would do. And you could do that simply by sending him an email and saying, hey, you know, how's it going today? What's up? Uh, oh, and by the way, I, uh, you know, I just wanted to verify you didn't want an inspection. And he would come back with something like, yeah, I don't want an inspection. At worst case scenario, you've got at least that. Uh, best case is you could have a disclaimer form made up that says waiving inspection, all right? Now, the question always comes is how do you write the inspection response? And this is a very tricky section on how you write the inspection response. Uh, there's been some, some big changes over the time, and I want to go back and look at this one section down here. Um, seller's response. You know, if they're unwilling or un, uh, un, or uh, unable to remedy, that could be a problem. But you also now have to give them the opportunity to fix whatever is there. If they fail to respond, then they're assumed to accept everything you've asked for. Now, they are allowed to ask for an extension in the response time, and I've talked to the IAR about this, and pretty much the first time they ask for an extension is almost automatically granted. If you read that in seller's inspection response form, there's actually no time frame for the acceptance, all right? So think about that uh, <clears throat> when you're dealing with this report that you have to write. They try and define defect and right here they do a pretty good job. And if you, well, you've not been in the business that long, that's why you're taking this course. This <clears throat> section D, G, this defect section right here has been something that they have been arguing with back and forth and on and off and all of that. You know, what is actually considered a defect? Well, there's now a new definition for you as to what they're considering a defect. Significantly impair the health and safety, reduces the value. If it's failed to be <clears throat> fixed, it would adversely affect the expected normal life. All of these items are considered a defect. Now, there have been arguments over the years where people go, oh, well, the light switch plate is cracked. That's a defect. No, that's not a defect, and that doesn't allow you to get out of the deal. So you have to be careful when you're writing this response on what you're determining the buyer needs to get fixed. And if the seller doesn't agree, then, oh, we're getting out because I asked for these three things to get fixed. Well, if it's not truly a defect, does the seller really need to agree to fix it? You know, hey, I want a new roof and I want you to repaint the living room. Don't laugh. 
That actually was a response that we had, oh, the end of last year. Those were the two things. They wanted a new roof and they wanted the living room painted. Our buyer said, we'll put a new roof on and they actually wanted to get out because, well, he wasn't willing to fix the, what they called fix, and I'm using finger quotes for those of you sitting at home, fix the paint, therefore we can get out. And we had to argue with him, no, that's not a defect. That is not something that if we deny, you can use as a defect to get out. The other thing that's kind of new, which is really kind of great, is letter H here. Buyer agrees that any property defect previously disclosed by the seller once again, that's that seller's disclosure or routine maintenance and minor repair items mentioned in, uh, yeah, in any report shall not be the basis for termination of this agreement. They put this in in the 2020 or maybe it was 2019. Now, what this actually fosters, in my opinion, is it fosters the seller to disclose everything. Because now if it's disclosed that it was a bad roof and the buyer went ahead and made an offer knowing that, one, his offer should have reflected the bad roof. And two, is he no longer can use that as a basis for getting out or terminating this agreement. That used to be the whole thing and we talked back about on, under contract section you know, we talked about that whole fact of if you mislead somebody to enter into a contract, that allows them to get out. So if I told you the roof was pristine and you found out it was 30 years old and had 27 layers, you in essence could go, hey, you misled me to get out or to get me into this purchase agreement. Now I want out. Well, the solution to that is this letter H. Now, if the seller says, hey, the house is pristine, except the roof is 30 years old, you got 27 layers, and the buyer makes an offer anyway, because remember, the buyer is supposed to see the seller's disclosure, and that is your job and one of your professional duties to collect that prior to writing the offer. You can't, the seller can't now say, you can't terminate the purchase that agreement you offered, because I told you it was a bad roof and you still entered into the agreement. So writing this response is something that's very key and tricky. Now, one of the other things that there were people trying to do there for a, a, just a short period of time was this whole, oh, I want the roof repair, but it's gotta be repaired by Jim who's wearing a blue turtleneck. There is this term, and once again, I am not a practicing attorney called the common man or the reasonable man that says you can't do that because if you said hey I want it repaired by Bob Smith on Thursday and the seller said we can't do that the buyer would go oh well you didn't agree to my term so I want out no that's not a common using the common man or the reasonable man theory in in court law you would say that's not reasonable you know I can get it fixed, but I'm not going to have Bob wear a blue turtleneck while he's doing it. Okay. So they tried that for a while. So be careful when you're doing that. Now, when you write the report, how much of the report do you give? This to me is a strategy question, depending on what you ask for, as opposed to what you show them. If it's something where there is, say, and let's just make up a number, 17 problems on the house and you only want one of them fixed, I typically would give the whole report to the seller so that he, you could say, dude, they found 17 things wrong. I want one fixed. I think that's reasonable. Now, if I was asking for one item to be fixed, and there was oh, that was the only item that was found to be an error or a defect or in violation or whatever you want, the term you want to use. In that particular case, I would probably only show them the portion of the report that wanted, that showed them that it was an error. Because what I don't want them to do on the other side is go, 
dude, there was one thing wrong with the entire house. You're, you're not paying true market value. I'm not fixing that. So what you show them as far as the report to me is predicated upon what is your buyer client asking for and what supports it the best. And sometimes it's the whole report. Sometimes it's only part of the report. Okay. Same thing with this. What does the inspection response say? We go back to that whole reasonable man. What are you really wanting them to do? And I see a lot of buyers that have, you know, well, it's got a bad roof and a bad water heater and the HVAC is old and the seller says, okay, I'll fix it. And the buyer says, no, I just want out. That is to me, one of the dumbest damn things I've ever heard. If your seller is telling you, Hey, I'll put a new roof, a new furnace in and you know, fix the stairs. Why would the buyer not want virtually a brand new house for what they're paying? I've always been confused with buyers that do that. Now, you know, a lot of buyers are go, well, they tried to lie to us, so I don't trust them the rest of the deal. Okay. Let's throw some of that stuff out because obviously that's a separate issue. If they're lying to you, then yeah, maybe. But what I'm saying is if the seller agrees to fix all of the stuff you've asked for, why would you not want to be able to say, okay, I bought a 20 year old home, but it's got a brand new furnace and a brand new roof. I'm not going to have to worry about those for 15 years, as opposed to buying one that's got, oh, a four year old or a five year old furnace. You're going to have to worry about that in 10 years. So I have never been more. What's the word I'm looking for, Dave? Yeah. Confused. Of course, I'm living in the state of confusion as to why people do that. Why does a buyer back out when the seller I've seen plenty of times agree to everything and the seller goes, well, ah, he, I'm, I'm just, I, I just don't feel good about it. Dude, you're getting everything you ask for. All right. Now there's another concern about reinspections. And I just had this with one of my agents the other day where they did not hire the inspector to reinspect any of the repairs. All they literally, all my agent literally did was took the invoices that the seller sent over that showed new furnace, 5,000, you know, whatever, 2000. And my agent said, well, they got them fixed. They sent us the invoice. Then when we went through the final walkthrough, all of a sudden there were still some questions. Hey, this doesn't look like it's been repaired. This doesn't look fixed. And I asked him, I said, did you have a reinspection? Well, no, we got the invoices. Really? Are you going to trust that person? Isn't that the whole reason that you had the inspection to begin with? You had it inspected because you didn't trust the seller that told you it was a good house. Oh no, we'll have an inspection. Now they tell you, oh, we fixed it. Why are you trusting them now? And most inspectors, if not all will do what they call a reinspection and they will reinspect now only the areas that were of concern. So it's not going to be a second whole house inspection. If there was a concern with the furnace and the pressure valve on the hot water heater, and you call your inspector and say, Hey, it was fixed. They told me it was fixed. I want you to reinspect it. He will go back out and look at those areas of concern. He will look at the pressure valve on the hot water heater and he will look at the roof and he will then give you, yes, it's, I can see that it's been new. It's been replaced or there's new shingling and new decking. I can see that from the underside. He is not going to go back out and do you a whole house and second inspection. But the good thing about that is, most inspectors discount that second inspection. You know, you pay three, three fifty for the first one. You may pay a hundred and a quarter for the second inspection. But to me, that's just another valid insurance policy that you had to him go back out and look at it again. How are you going to get these repairs done? And one of the other things you need to do is create this time frame. You want to create the time frame for the inspections to be complete so that you can view those inspections. And if it wasn't complete to your satisfaction, you still have time to do it again. Typically on major defects that need to be fixed, like, Hey, the roof's got to be fixed or there's going to be a new HVAC. 
you would say something to the effect, I want those completed five days before closing or three days before closing. You're never going to want to go in two hours before your closing time to inspect the HVAC and find out they either didn't do it, they didn't do it to your satisfaction, maybe they didn't complete it, and all of a sudden you got closing in two hours. So you should always ask for something like that about, hey, I want a new roof, and the seller goes, okay, I'll give you a new roof. Well, I want it done three days before closing so that we can see it, make sure it doesn't leak, I want to be able to get on it and look at it. I want my inspector to get on it and look at it. So think about that with the repairs and the time frame on when they're getting done. Now, the last thing is this whole home warranty thing. Home warranties are not insurance policies. They are not your homeowner's insurance. They usually cover things that maybe your insurance won't. But you have to understand that there are things that the home warranties don't. And most home warranties have a deductible and a trip charge for whoever's doing the work because the home warranty company doesn't do the work typically. I can only think of one that actually has their own people. Most of them subcontract out another HVAC company if you make a home warranty claim. Well, that person ends up charging you a trip charge, and then there's a deductible. So understand what your home warranty covers versus your homeowner's insurance versus who's doing the repairs, all right? Now, I have heard a lot of sellers before that have told my buyer clients, hey, there's an issue with the furnace, but we're gonna put a home warranty on this, so just take it with a bad furnace, and then when it, uh, when you move in, make a claim and they'll fix your furnace. Dude, that's the dumbest damn thing I've ever heard of, all right? First of all, you could almost construe that as a fraud if you knew there was a defect, didn't tell your home warranty, and then tried to make a claim on it. Second of all, like homeowner's insurance, home warranty companies may also have what they call a look-back period, meaning for 10 days, they're going to look back to the original owner because there's no way in hell your furnace went bad in the first three hours of you owning the property, you know? And they can tell that kind of stuff when the guy comes out to do the uh, replacement, he's gonna look at it and go, this fuse is burned out and it's been burned out for a month or the wiring's, you know, has melted. That didn't happen in three hours. So there are ways that they can go, no, we're gonna, disavow this warranty and now your client, the buyer, the new owner is now stuck with a, a, a furnace that's not working because he got conned into trying to fraud a home warranty company and got stuck. So be careful of that as well. All right. Um, get yourself a cup of coffee. We'll come back out and do some more here in just a second.